Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. Um, we'll give everyone just another minute to join, and then uh, we'll go ahead and get started. <clears throat> Alia, you have the presentation. You want to kind of get that shared? Sure. Yeah, we'll do. We'll do. Let, let me do that.
can you see the screen with the presentation? Uh, hey, Gauri, can you see the screen with the presentation? Yes, I can. I'm talking on okay. mute. <laughs> oh, okay, okay, because, okay, okay, that's fine. All right, um, we'll go ahead. I see there's a chat. Yes, okay. Um, hi, Ms. Galloway. Okay, we'll go ahead and get it started. Um, thank you everyone for joining. We're expecting a few more people to jump in, but we'll let them kind of catch on <laughs> as they come on. So um, we have Ms. Galloway here today, and then we also have another speaker um, who's going to join us a little bit later. And the topic of tonight's uh, college readiness discussion is financial aid. <clears throat> so we want to go ahead and get that started. And Maria, I see that you have just joined. So if you can hear us, um, yep, go ahead and get us started. Hi, good evening, everyone. Um, I want to welcome our speaker, welcome our parents. Um, I know that we've had a lot of events um, over the last week and this evening in particular between uh, starting in the morning we had um, the school uh, put on career day so thank you to all the parents who participated um, if you don't know ask your kids um, we had a lot of parents and community members come in um, as we do every year to do career day and um, that is uh, very helpful for our students uh, so starting in the morning we had that and then we had um, a few events throughout um, uh, the day, the Mia's dinner, I think they close in an hour, but if you haven't had dinner or if you're feeling peckish, order something for Mia's <laughs> table um, and 20% uh, is going to the PTO. And then we've had um, a few other uh, meetings uh, today. So thank you for sticking, uh, uh, sticking with us. Financial aid um, is close to my heart. Um, I, without financial aid, I wouldn't have gone to college. My husband wouldn't, wouldn't have gone, uh, I wouldn't have gone to PA school and he wouldn't have gone to law school. So um, this is super helpful. It's complicated. We're gonna try to keep it short, um, but I really appreciate uh, Ms. Galloway for doing this presentation. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Maria. Um, Ms. Galloway, if you're on, go ahead and uh, take us through it. Yes, good evening, good evening. Um, yes, financial aid is very dense. Um, there's so many different nuances, but for the most part, try to condense it so that overall you guys have a, a general understanding of how financial aid works. And then of course, I think we're gonna do another session maybe in the spring because we can talk about financial aid for hours to be honest, but um, we're just gonna start with kind of like the basics. So I hope this is very helpful to you guys. Also just understand we are, well, I am working to streamline a lot of resources for you guys. And so thank you to those who filled out that um, survey at the other session last week. That was very helpful. You guys had a lot of questions. And so that kind of helped me kind of put together a lot of one pagers and flyers to kind of help answer those initial questions. So those will be coming out probably after um, Thanksgiving, but we'll go ahead and we'll talk about financial aid, uh, various tools to help you guys um, understand ways to pay for college. And so we'll kick it off. Um, I think on this slide, it's, it's me again. Um, greetings, it's a pleasure to meet all of you guys. Um, again, I do support, my two main campuses are Carnegie and DeBakey. Typically at Carnegie Mondays and Wednesdays when we're not being pulled for trainings. And then Tuesdays and Thursdays I'm at DeBakey and I'm temporarily supporting HSPDA until um, they get a full-time person. But um, yes, eventually I'm hoping we do get a full-time school uh, in the future. So yes, that's how I'll be supporting um, your students. And then going to the meat and the potatoes, um, the agenda, so essentially paying for college, what that looks like, for one, how much does college cost? What all factors into that? Um, the different types of financial aid applications, we'll talk about that very briefly. We'll also talk about some special circumstances that some students may fall into and how they can navigate that as far as paying for college. Um, also, we'll probably get a few financial aid award letters and then uh, we'll talk about the hot scholarships and some upcoming scholarship opportunities I have planned uh, before Christmas break, returning from Thanksgiving break. And so paying for college, so what does college cost? How can it be affordable? We'll do a brief little breakdown. Um, and so college tuition and fees. So tuition essentially, for one, are you in-state, are you out of state? And then two, how much do your college classes um, cost? And we'll talk about any other additional fees. 
um, books and supplies. So basically the materials that you need for your classes. We'll also talk about room and board. So if you're going to college away from home, you do have to have somewhere to stay. So typically what does that look like? Also, most campuses require you to have a meal plan. And so that costs money as well. As we know, none of this stuff is free. And then also um, typically they'll take into account um, transportation, miscellaneous things and stuff like that and personal items. But we'll talk about what financial aid covers specifically. And so just a breakdown, just very briefly, you might be able to see this kind of small, but not to show my age here, but this was actually um, my tuition or my fee bill going into my first semester at UTSA. So it's a little longer, but it's all I could get on the slide. But this is kind of when your students start registering for classes, what's gonna be generated is a bill. And so this kind of tells you like what all you're going to be paying for. Um, as you can see, my housing was almost $4,000. Um, at that time, as we know, inflation, so it's definitely been up a little higher than that, but that's kind of a breakdown of what college essentially is going to cost. Um, as you can see, for example, when you go on college tours, they're like, here's our recreation center. It's free. Make sure you guys take advantage of it. In a way, it is free. However, students are actually still paying for these things, So just letting students know, like, whenever you do get on a college campus, just make sure you take advantage of all the resources, because technically, it is free, you have to show your ID to get in, but essentially you are paying for it as well. Um, so that was just kind of a general of what that would look like. Um, on the next slide, uh, very briefly, we'll talk about need blind admissions. And so basically these are gonna kind of be like your selective schools that don't necessarily take in um, your ability to pay for college as far as admissions. So they're not going to look at, oh, well, can this student pay for it? That's not going to be based on the admissions decision. So most schools have a need blind admissions approach. Basically, when they're looking at your student's application, they're not looking at financial aid or anything like that. They're strictly looking at your student's academic capabilities. And then also some schools are need wear admissions. And so sometimes, not all the time, and some schools, I can talk about this later if there's time, but some schools um, will take financial aid into consideration for um, your admissions. Um, these are typically going to be your international students. So these are going to be students who might be on a certain visa, but they live here now, but they can't do the FAFSA. And so those are some of the students that they'll kind of take into consideration as far as need or admissions. But for the most part, um, these are going to be your selective schools. Most of your public schools aren't going to be need blind or need aware. And then cost of attendance, or as we like to abbreviate the COA. So basically each school by law has to put on their website how much a general estimate of how much is going to cost to attend their university. And so we have our direct costs, which is gonna be your tuition and fees and your room and board. And so oftentimes when I'm sitting down with students and we're looking at their financial aid package, so how much they're being offered to attend this school, um, we usually just look at tuition and fees, room and board, because that's what the student is being billed. If you looked at my bill, I didn't have books and supplies on there. Travel expenses was not on there or miscellaneous. Um, financial aid is not essentially paying for that stuff, and the school is not billing you for that on your, um, in your tuition and fee bill. So whenever we're looking at cost of attendance, I usually tell students, although it's good to factor in how much is going to cost plane ticket, your books and supplies, that stuff is good to know. However, when it comes to financial aid, really all financial aid, whenever the school receives the money, this is what it's paying for. So tuition and fees and room and board. But combined holistically, this is gonna make up your cost of attendance. But I usually tell students, don't worry too much, for example, and we'll look at a few examples, but if the cost of the attendance is 26,000, I can guarantee maybe about 10K of that is gonna be your indirect cost. So really we just wanna look at the direct cost. So what financial aid is going to cover what's going to be on your bill. Um, and so we'll, we'll, it'll make a little bit more sense in a little bit. Um, as you can see, quick breakdown, um, the first column is in-state public schools. And so if you look, um, Texas, uh, give or take, about 9K, we'll round up, I typically like to round up 10K. Um, as you can see, we have books on here, we have travel and we have entertainment. Those are typically numbers that we would not factor in whenever I'm working with a student to break down their financial aid award letter. We really, when we want to talk about, okay, I, realistically, how much do I need to pay for college? We're looking at tuition and we're looking at fees and we're looking at room and board. That's kind of like the meat and potatoes. So as you can see for the total, you can kind of shave uh, like maybe a couple thousand of that off. And then as you can see out of state, um, you're gonna be out of state student. 
um, that's going to be a little, well, not a little bit more, it's actually going to be a whole lot more. And then we start looking at private colleges and private universities, of course, the tuition is going to be a lot more there too. So I can see it kind of varies for the most part. So especially when we're talking about building a college list, that's why I tell students, we don't need to have 10 out of state schools and just two in state schools. You definitely want to have a balance, right? Because unfortunately, when those financial aid packages start coming in, um, oftentimes some colleges don't necessarily work in the favor of the student. And so we just want to make sure that they have options um, going across the board. Oh, this is the annual fees, correct? This is per year. Yes. Mm -hmm. And it's just kind of a brief example. I think on one of the slides I have UT Austin and they talk about for their full year. So for the full academic year, that's what their estimate is. But yeah, this is just kind of like for the full year. Well, actually this is a semester. This is by semester for this one, for the tuition. So you can actually, if you will double this and that could be your cost of attendance for the full academic year, fall and spring. Oh yeah, I forgot those features were on there. <laughs> there we go, yes. So kind of what I was saying, your books, your fee, your travel, your entertainment, we typically don't take that into account. Even though it's nice to know, it's a good estimate to have in mind when you're preparing to go off. But essentially when we're talking about financial aid and when it gets released to the school, the mainly tuition, fees, room and board is being paid out for that. Let me go to the next slide. And so this is the Houston area. Now these numbers are definitely off. This is 2019 to 2020. Um, and so for UH, your tuition is, you're looking at about 5K, almost six. And then when you're looking at your uh, room and board, you're looking at about four. And this is probably for the room and board, this is probably one of like the lower end, cheaper um, housing at UH. Um, and so that's typically how much that's gonna cost. As we know, UH, DHC, they don't have room and board. So students, you don't have to worry about that. They don't have off campus, on campus housing. But as you can see here, books, for one, this number is very variable. Oftentimes you can have students who can, maybe someone who's upperclassmen, they can borrow books from them. Oftentimes nowadays you can find textbooks online. And so these numbers are just estimates. But as I stated, um, colleges and universities by law have to have a general estimate or a cost of attendance on their website. And so books, very variable, it, it, it often depends. And so we really only look at tuition and fees and room and board. And so when students come in, and this is based off of uh, being full-time, full-time it's taking anywhere from four to five classes or 12 to 15 uh, semester credit hours. Um, and this is, like I said, this is 2019, 2020. As we know, inflation um, is, is a thing and it's at large. And so these numbers are definitely um, have increased as well. Definitely UH, I can say for sure. And so we can go to the next slide. So this is um, this is UT Austin. I pulled this today, so this is very accurate. As you can see, UT Austin, um, definitely one of those more selective schools uh, public in the state of Texas. But as you can see in that first column, for students who live um, on campus or off campus, they live in a, an apartment, I can see the tuition is very variable. And again, it depends on how many classes they're taking. But you're looking anywhere from like 10 to 14K. I typically like to uh, round up just so students aren't surprised in the end. Um, as you can see, room and board staying on campus, it varies. Like those older traditional dorms on campus are typically not going to be as much. They're definitely gonna be cheaper. But if you've been to Austin, they have a lot of different, um, they have newer dorms. Those are gonna be a little bit more expensive as well. Um, and then as we can see here, again, transportation, personal and miscellaneous, those are very variable numbers. They change and they're not the same for everyone. So we typically, I don't even factor that in when we're talking about financial aid and how much is going to be paid out. We're mainly just looking at tuition, room and board. And then we're also looking at, uh, yeah, tuition and fees and room and board. And as you can see there, if we did the numbers for that, we're looking at about like, uh, I'll round up, we'll say like 26K. And as you can see, the total cost of attendance here is anywhere from between 29 and 32. And so that's, like I said, it's very variable. If we really get down to the mid, we're probably looking at 26, 27. And so that's why it's really important. I let students know that don't get too bogged down at the big numbers because there's definitely some, some wiggle room, of course. And then also, as you can see, someone who stays with their parents, they're not paying for room and board unless the parent is holds them responsible. They might be, but for the most part, they're really just looking at tuition. And so a lot of the students who might be going to school local, staying at UH, maybe not staying on campus, really all they're looking at as far as financial aid is just tuition and fees. That's pretty much about it. And then a non-resident, so someone who may not have been born here or maybe they're not from Texas, they're definitely paying a whole lot more, close to 70K <laughs> for a financial aid. So that was just UT Austin. Um, most of our senior class at Carnegie has applied to UT Austin. And so I thought this would just be 
a pretty good uh, figure for you guys to look at. And I pulled that today. So that I believe is as of last year. So still fairly recent. We can go to the next slide. Oh, net price calculator. I tell students all the time, if you're looking at some of these out of state schools, highly selective, it's very important that you use the net price calculator. Each um, of these schools has it on their website. Basically what the net price calculator does is it's kind of um, a good, uh, it's basically a good estimate as far as facts, right? And so if students are interested in how much they might potentially have to pay, they need to go on the school's website. So for example, for Rice, I usually tell students, especially if you're applying ED, you definitely need to sit down with your parent because the net price calculator asks questions that a student probably would not know, only their parent would know. So you need to sit down with your parents, include them in this process. Basically, once you put in the information, it'll spit out a dollar amount. And so it'll say, based on this information, we're expecting you to, to come out of pocket this much. And so this is really important for students to do before they apply to schools, because if you know it's something that's kind of, you know, unless you're applying for scholarships, you're going to be uh, very efficient in doing that, then of course apply. But sometimes the net price calculator gives students a good idea of whether or not they will be applying to that school or not, because it'll tell you based off the information you put in, we're expecting your family to contribute this much. So I usually tell students, you know, just kind of play around with it, definitely use it. Um, it definitely should be a deciding factor when you're building your college list. And this just kind of tells you, this is for a two lane. It just tells you, they look at income tax turn, uh, returns, look at statements, bank statements. Um, this is a little bit more um, intrusive than FAFSA, but it is good for um, students and uh, parents to kind of look at. And go to the next slide. Okay, financial aid, the different types of financial aid. So what is financial aid essentially? Um, fi financial aid is essentially any grant, scholarship, uh, paid employment, we call that work study offered to a student to help them pay for it. Um, it could be need-based and it could also be merit-based based off of your academic profile, how well you do. And it could also be just simply a combination of both. And so there's sort different sources of financial aid. So you can receive financial aid from the federal government um, you can also, that's where FAFSA kind of comes into play, the Pell Grant, SCLG Grant, your loans, your subsidized, unsubsidized loans. You can also get financial aid from the state. So that's Texas, which is why we tell students, you need to make sure your FAFSA is in by January 15th. Um, you can get the Texas grant, stuff like that. Also colleges and universities. This is why we're, we push students to apply by priority deadline because essentially colleges and universities, they have a pile of money that they receive from the government and they're like, hey, you know, this can go to students however you best see fit. And so oftentimes applying by your priority deadline is a way to get a pool of that money and also a private institution. So these are gonna be your foundations, your nonprofits. These are gonna be kind of like our outside partners that offer scholarships, but they have their own uh, set of criteria for how students can obtain those scholarships. But these are all the, the different sources that students can apply for financial aid. And then we'll talk about them a little bit more in depth um, on the next slide, I believe. Oh, types of financial aid. So again, scholarships, we call this a uh, gift aid. Um, this is typically money that doesn't have to be paid back. Um, and it can be based on need or merit. There's also grants similar. This is also um, gift aid. It does not have to be paid back. Also, there's a work study. Essentially, what work study is, um, basically, you're working on campus. The whole idea behind work study is that your academics are at the forefront. And so when I was when I had work study, I was working on campus, I was doing homework. Um, they don't let you work. It depends on the school. They don't let work, they don't let you work past 18 hours, 15 hours. And so work study, oftentimes students don't know what that is. And so when they're doing their fast, they just say no. And I, and I highly encourage them not to do that because when you can be, it's nice to be offered, but if you just put no, you won't be offered at all. And so when you're offered, you can always say no. But if you just put no up front, you won't even be offered it. So it's a good opportunity for students to make a little extra money while they're on campus. Um, and also loans, that's your subsidized, unsubsidized. Those are loans that do have to be paid back. We usually say unsubsidized loans are like uncool because you're accruing interest uh, while you're in school. And so we also say subsidized loans um, you're not accruing any interest on those loans as you're taking them out. We also, I also tell students loans are not necessarily a bad thing. Um, we just try to make sure they're educated on how loans work. So for example, if you're offered a $5,000 loan, but you're short maybe $1,000, you can take $1,000 of that $5,000 loan. So we usually say they're not a bad thing. Just make sure you're borrowing responsibly and you know what you're getting yourself into. Um, next slide. So your financial aid applications, let's kind of hold off on the CSS profile uh, really quick, but um, students are either gonna be doing the FAFSA or the TASFA. 
Um, if you're doing the FAFSA, you're a permanent resident, you're a U.S. citizen, uh, there's a certain visa you have to uh, be on to do the FAFSA. Um, if none of these apply to you, then you are doing the TASFA. Um, you have to be a Texas resident. You might be undocumented. You might be under DACA. And so um, Texas is one of the few states that offers financial aid to students who might be undocumented. Or um, I know certain students may be um, working towards citizenship and they're on a certain visa. And so it does limit them to just Texas schools. However, there is aid available to them in the state of Texas. And then we'll also talk about the CSS profile. So some students, you're either going to be, going to be doing one, so FAFSA or TASFA. And if you're applying to more selective schools, you might be doing the CSS profile. So you're either doing FAFSA or TASFA, and then depending on the schools you're doing, you might also be doing the CSS profile. So we'll go ahead and we'll go to the next slide. So with the FAFSA, it's free to complete. Um, typically, students just have to have their account created. They log in, they complete the information with their parent. FAFSA is mainly going based off of tax information. So this here is 2021 tax information. So it is free, and all it does is determine what you're eligible for. Um, the CSS profile is not free. Some students might qualify for a fee waiver. I usually tell them just send me an email. Excuse me. But the CSS profile, you do have to pay for that. And again, the CSS profile is not required of um, all students. It just depends on the school that you go to. Um, and so students typically need to go to College Board, look and see at the list of school, and if their school is requiring it, they need to do the CSS profile. Um, next slide. So if students are uh, um, kind of unclear as to what financial application they are doing, they need to look at this figure. I usually, I usually send this to them. And so, you know, if they check off one of these boxes in the left, then they will be doing the FAFSA. If not, then they're doing the TASFA. Um, and I can send this out to uh, parents later, but we'll move on to the uh, next slide. And so understanding the EFC, or what we like to call the expected family contribution, um, the expected family contribution, I'm sorry, we can go to the next slide, um, is basically a formula that FAFSA uses and that the schools will use to. Um, it takes into account your family's income, the family size, how many students uh, might already be in college, um, and also may also take into account assets. Uh, but also, basically, the EFC determines the need. And so it's a formula that's kind of Computed and typically when students submit their financial aid application on the confirmation email, it will say what their EFC is and what they're eligible for. So typically those higher EFCs, um, basically you may not, that you're considered not need-based. Um, and so the lower EFCs, they might be eligible for some grants and stuff like that. But we'll talk about um, CSS profile in a little bit. So we'll move to the next slide. Um, oh, so back to EFC, they're looking at income basically. So wages, earned income, um, they might be looking at real estate. They also might be looking at like if you receive child support. And if you do the FAFSA, if you do the, um, the IRS data retrieval tool, basically it pulls all the information the FAFSA is asking for, it'll pull it for you. So it's easy, I highly recommend doing that. It saves you from having to go through a bunch of papers, look through your tax return and put numbers in. It'll just pull the stuff straight from the IRS website for you, highly recommend. Um, also, it talks about assets. Um, if you ask me, again, it just depends. Um, and so if you have a question about assets, just reach out to me separately. But uh, typically, most colleges will not ask for like bank statements. So they may not ask, well, you know, what are your assets, stuff like that. Really, they're looking at the AGI. So I usually leave it up to parents. If you want to put your assets in the past, you can. Also, um, it's a matter of knowing what schools you're applying to as well. And then also they take into the account the household size. So how many people are in the household? Um, do you have additional um, kids for one? Are any of your students already in college? And that's undergrad, not graduate. And then also a lot of families are taking care of aunts, uncles, um, grandparents and stuff like that. So they take a lot of those things um, into account. Um, next slide. And so going back to that, um, so your EFC will decrease based on the number of students that you may already have in college. Because for one, um, let's say for example, you may be on the higher earning, I guess, side, but if you have like maybe a ton of kids in college, then they kind of take that into account. Oh, they may already be contributing to that. So they do take how many children you have into account and that's only undergrad, that's not graduate. Um, also they take into account like siblings, like I said, if they're already attending a higher education institution. And then um, they typically do not take into account any, again, like I said, parents or siblings pursuing like a graduate degree and stuff like that, but they will take into account any other children that you have and if those children are also going to be in college. And so that can kind of decrease your EFC, which is what we want. Uh, next slide. 
And so just when you thought you got FAFSA down, just when I thought I had FAFSA down, <laughs> there are going to be some changes starting next year. Um, so next year, there will be no EFC. There's going to be something called an SAI. We went to a training, um, I think it was September, we went to NACAC, and they kind of gave us a, a brief little heads up. But um, all basically everything I'm telling you about FAFSA is potentially going to change. And some of it for the good and some of it maybe not. Um, but um, they're taking out completely the number of children in college that, that's gone. So just, I guess, forget what I just told you. And then also, um, they're also moving from, um, there's, there's certain rules for students who have divorced parents. And so that kind of depends how you do the fast, but they're gonna be a little bit more clearer about that. But they're also going to expand the eligibility for students to be considered Pell eligible, so the Pell grant. Oftentimes, I know a lot of uh, parents might be upset because you may feel as if um, your tax information doesn't really, um, doesn't clearly, I guess, talk about how much your student should be eligible for. So I'm hoping that that kind of alleviates some of those kind of like concerns, but they are going to expand the eligibility for Pell Grant, which I think is a good thing. And now what that looks like, we're not sure, but yes, yeah, starting next year, I guess we're all gonna have to relearn what FAFSA is going to look like. So just putting that, I guess if you're a parent who's an underclassman, it is going to look different. Um, so yes, next slide. And so like I was saying, the FAFSA, uh, right now, if you have a senior, they're doing the, they're always doing the next year. So they're doing 2023, 2024. And like I said, that's going to look different next year. So we will keep you posted on updates. The next slide, I want to talk on TASPA very briefly. Um, like I said, um, Texas is one of the few states that actually offers financial aid to undocumented students or students who may be on a different visa or they're awaiting citizenship and they're working on it. Um, this is paper, this is, this is entirely paper. So we have a student who's doing TASPA, uh, just tell them to come see me. I usually email it to them. I have them fill out as much as, as, much as they can and then I kind of look it over, we look for gaps and stuff like that. But the task is completely paper. There are only a few universities, um, so UH and UT, they have something called an e-TASPA. And so they kind of have their own kind of online TASPA um, within their portals. With UT is my status, um, with UH is the UH My Access portal. Um, and so there are some that have online, it was supposed to be online this year per the Higher Education Coordinating Board, but it's been kind of pushed back. So it is a paper application, just a heads up. Um, next slide. And like I said, there's only a few states. Um, there's Texas, California, New York, I believe Wyoming. Only a few offer in-state, not only just in-state financial aid, but they offer in-state tuition as well. So if you have a student who might be considered technically an international student because they're on a certain visa, um, like I said, they are limited because they do have to stay in Texas, but, um, not only will they be considered for us, they won't be considered out-of-state tuition, they will be considered in-state, and there's also in-state financial aid for those students. So just kind of, I hope that kind of alleviates some pressures for some students. Also, if you know of any students or any parents maybe who might be working off citizenship, but they're on a certain visa, stuff like that, um, just kind of put this in here. December 10th, it is a Saturday, there's something called the Dream Summit. Um, and so they talk about a wealth of, uh, I will be there volunteering as I'm voluntold, but um, there's definitely, I highly recommend this for underclassmen because there's definitely gonna be sessions for writing a personal statement. There's gonna be speakers who talk about what it was like navigating the college admissions process from an international um, standpoint. So highly recommended if you are able to join. I have something scheduled to go out on Friday to parents and students about this. So if you have questions, just let me know. But I do have an email scheduled to go out about this in depth. Uh, next slide. Also, so I hope you guys knew this. I think I touched on it briefly, but it is a graduation requirement for students to do the uh, either FAFSA or TASFA. This is the second year it's been a thing, so it is fairly new. So students, to meet this requirement, they can do two things. They could either actually submit the financial application or they can um, use the form that TEA provides to opt out and that has to be submitted to their counselor. Um, some students have already been like, you know what, I talked to my parents, we're just gonna opt out. And you know, that's totally fine. I just tell students, instead of making that decision for yourself, make sure you sit down with the parent or sit down with someone and talk about what all that means. Um, I typically, I highly encourage students not to opt out because there's many instances where um, I know oftentimes students are like, well, I don't qualify for not, for financial aid or I know I'm not going to get anything, um, et cetera, et cetera. But oftentimes if you're applying to those more selective schools, we've seen that with the CSS profile where FAFSA might say technically, oh, you make too much, you can provide for your, your students financial aid, stuff like that. There's instances where they do the CSS profile and the CSS profile, which does 
It's very nosy. It asks a lot of invasive information, just a heads up. But the CSS profile might highlight, oh, you know what? You do have a need somewhere. So we usually tell students, you know, of course, we re totally respect your decisions as long as you're not with the parent. If that makes sense, totally opt out. However, if students are applying for certain scholarships, sometimes these scholarships, even though they're not need-based scholarships, they do want to see a financial application on file. So just a heads up on that. If you have questions, you can just shoot me. Sorry, um, when, is this, when is this done? Is this junior level or can freshmen and sophomores do it? Oh, so just their senior year. So yeah, just, just their senior, senior year. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> Yes, yeah, yeah. But in, like I said, it's, this is the second year it's been a thing, but it is good for underclassmen to know and the parents to know as well that during the senior year, it is a graduation requirement. They can either one, do the application or they can sign an opt-out form and submit to their counselor. So, you know, it's not like a, you have to do this, but yeah. You know. And then again, like I said, the CSS profile, it is through College Board. Um, not all schools use it. So if students want to know, oh, like, does this school require the CSS profile? They just need to go on the website and look at the school. Like I said, it's very invasive. They ask a lot of information. They ask stuff like, oh, if you're financing a car, how much do you have left to pay on it? It's nosy. However, like I stated, there are often times where the students submit their FAFSA and they're, they just saw gaps. So a lot of these colleges and universities Ultimately, they are the decider of how much financially they're going to offer a student. And they have their own kind of formulas and stuff for how they determine who needs aid and who doesn't. So that's the CSS profile. We'll move to the next one because I need an hour alone just for that. Um, and again, this is kind of a comparison for the CSS profile. Um, as I stated, they all use different um, deadlines. CSS profile looks at um, real estate, look at a variety of things. Um, I won't get into depth about it, but we'll move on to the next um, slide. So spring of 2023, if you have any seniors currently, these are some things that they need to um, keep in mind. I'm trying to drill this into them as much as I can. Um, next slide. So seniors, we are coming up on Thanksgiving break. For one, um, I think Carnegie, for the most part, I think we're sitting at like 65% financial aid application completion, which is really good. Um, just letting them know they need to have their financial aid application in, and it needs to be 2023, 2024. Um, also, if they are using the FAFSA or the TASFA over the break, I highly encourage them to just go back into their FAFSA and make sure that the schools that they are applying to matches the schools they have on that list. Oftentimes, students in the spring when financial aid packages are coming out, they're like, oh, I haven't gotten my package for Brown yet. And we go back and look at their FAFSA, and Brown was never added on their school. And so I tell on their list, I additional information, and that takes weeks to process. So I just tell students over the break, just please make sure that the schools you're applying to match the schools that are on your uh, financial aid application just to kind of save you time for processing. Um, also, they I think right now Carnegie's at 91% financial aid applications, so we're good there. Um, and so I tell them if they're still working on them, they may have one or two submitted, but they ideally need to have all the applications done before Christmas break, ideally. Over the break, they can chill, they can relax. They might even be getting financial aid. Um, they might even be getting acceptance letters over the break. So they need to do that. Also, they need to be applying for scholarships to maximize their opportunities in aid. What we're noticing is that even students their some of their financial aid packages aren't even even though they're need based it shows that they they need the money we're noticing that their packages aren't as competitive either. so students definitely need to put a little skin in the game and they need to be applying for outside scholarships um, next slide also some students have a special circumstance um, and so if there's ever an instance where they just can't provide parent information maybe they're at risk of being homeless or on companies stuff like that they need to come talk to us because their financial aid application is going to look very different it's going to be submitting a lot of additional um, documents and so the sooner we know that the better um, next slide and so just some tips for success we need students to be intentional so just from the jump, they need to apply to their schools early. They need to pay attention to their deadlines. And essentially, like early bird gets the worm. Whenever this application opens up, for one, it needs to be done between October 1st and January 15th. If it's done after that, they can still receive aid, but like the money, the pile for money is dwindling, right? And so I usually tell students, if we're at Carnegie and if Ms. Alvarenga is like, hey, we're handing out $10,000 on Friday, December 5th, like, are you going to get in line Thursday, December 4th? 
or are you going to get in line December 5th whenever it's ending, right? So I usually tell students they need to be intentionally to start early and just pay attention to their deadlines. Um, next slide. I think we're wrapping up here as well. Oh, the hot scholarships. Um, I sent that out. I'll usually send, I usually send on every email I send just so they can, the students can say they never received it because they did. Um, but the hot scholarships that's out right now. Also, um, I came across a bunch of additional scholarships that aren't on that list, but these are people who reach out to, you know, the counselors at Carnegie myself and they're like, hey, we have this scholarship opportunity. Can you push out to students? So usually they're getting scholarships from a bunch of different um, avenues. I know it's overwhelming, but I usually tell them just, just find 10 minutes to go through all their emails and just look at everything. Um, next slide. And then um, just some helpful resources. I know someone was asking about the Khan Academy. Um, but I, I'll connect them later. Um, but these are just some additional um, helpful resources. And I think, next slide, I think that's it. Yes, um, oh, if you weren't on the call last week, um, but if you would like to get these, not text, but if you would like to get the emails that I send out to the students, if you're not registered on Naviance, you can scan this QR code. I think when I checked before the meeting, there were only five parents who did it, but I'm hoping maybe you guys were able to get access to Naviance. Um, and so also, you guys, there's, there's an option for you to put questions on this QR code. So those questions kind of help me like figure out like what processes I need to put in place so that this stuff is easily accessible to you guys. Um, but all in all, that is everything. <laughs> like I said, we can talk about financially for hours, but we don't have that much time. So just kind of a, a brief overview. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Um, Galloway. So um, that's a really great point that you brought up about uh, Naviance. Um, just to remind all the parents, on November 7th is when the email had gone out to each one of your students with codes uh, for the parents to be able to log in. So if you haven't received your code yet, um, ask for it from your student. And the exact date when they received that email was November 7th. And if they don't have it, um, you can certainly reach one of us um, and, and we'll get you to the right contact at school to make sure that you can get your code um, and be able to uh, get into Naviance. Okay. Now, we do have time for questions at the end of this call, but um, I did want to introduce one um, other speaker. We have, uh, <coughs> excuse me, Crystal Toussaint, who is um, a Carnegie alum, and she is here to talk about um, her experience a little bit uh, with financial aid and just kind of give us parents kind of a different perspective of someone who's been on the other side of this. Um, Crystal, welcome and thank you for joining our call. Go ahead and take it away. Hi, I'm Crystal Toussaint. I've been an arts educator since 2002. And um, I love helping students prepare for college. Um, I love helping them find money for school. And the biggest piece of advice I would give everyone is the early bird gets the worm. People think it's just about how high your grades are. No, it actually isn't. I've actually met students who have well over a 4.0, but because they waited to the last minute to send off their stuff, they're barely getting money for school. And I've also seen students who may have a 3-0, but because they sent off their stuff early, they got the maximum amount of money and scholarships they could get for a school. So the biggest um, thing that you definitely want to do is get your applications in as early as possible. Complete your FAFSA as soon as it's available. So, and make sure, like she said earlier, that you put all of your schools on that FAFSA to receive it because you will be wondering why they haven't sent you a package and it's because you never sent them your FAFSA information. Um, also, in order to win scholarships, if you want to win 10 scholarships, you need to apply to 100 scholarships. <laughs> you know, you need to do way more than what you think you should, like double, quadruple, triple it. And 
people think you have to do a different application for each one. You do, but really you can have a standard letter that you can tweak and also have standard recommendation letters that your recommenders understand that you would change the name of the scholarship in it so that you can quickly send those off. So it may seem like I got to do a hundred scholarships, but if you have those standard pieces of items that you are um, using for your applications, they all pretty much ask for the same thing. And even if the, the essay is a little different, usually the stuff that you have in a general essay, you can add to it or take from it to create that essay for your next application. Also, don't knock small scholarships because small scholarships build up to bigger money. And so you may win five $500 scholarships, that's $2,500. Then you may turn around and win one scholarship that's $2,500. So now you have $5,000. So you want to just get as much money as possible. And if you think you remotely um, could qualify for it or you remotely would want to do that certain thing, just apply for it. Sometimes, scholarships go on um untapped into because they don't have enough people who are applying for them so one of the books that i wanted to share with you is called the ultimate scholarship the the ultimate scholarship book and they do it every year this is the 2023 example and you can find it on Amazon and it has a billion dollars worth of scholarships, grants, and prizes that you can win. And you want to constantly year around apply for scholarship money. The biggest thing that people make a mistake with is getting money when you go to college and then you don't continue to apply for scholarships. You should be applying for scholarships all four years that you're in school. Do you ever stop getting money? Needing money? Absolutely not. So you want to keep applying for scholarships. And that's really, really important. Um, and then also, don't forget to tap into the scholarships that are at your school. And I always tell my students, the people that you should be best friends with, find out when their birthday is, make sure you give them a Christmas card, make sure that you see them at the beginning of the year to welcome them back and tell them bye at the end of the year when you're leaving. The financial aid director and the register. When I was in school, the financial aid director always helped me find money because they remember you, you've built a relationship with them and they'll look out for you. When I transferred, I, I started out at Sam Houston State University and then I transferred to Spelman College because I always wanted to attend a historically black college or university and HBCU. So when I got there, I made sure to become friends with the register. The register saved me from not having enough credits in order to graduate on time. Because when I went to go check in with her at the end of my junior year, she was like, you know what? You don't have all the credits you need. Um, you need to go this summer and take a philosophy class so that you would have all of your credits. If I had not been connected with her and didn't have that relationship, I would have been like many students who get to that final year and they're crying because they don't have all their credits and they don't have, you know, they're not available for them to take and then they can't graduate on time. And you got to create those relationships so that you can have checkpoints and people that look out for you. And I would also say, um, look at alternative ways to help you defray costs. One of the things that I did at Sam Houston State University, I was, at a, I was a resident assistant. 
all schools don't give you the great benefits that some schools do, but at Sam Houston State University, being a resident assistant allowed me to not pay for room and board. That's a big chunk of your education. And I would just be, I would just do programs for the, the students on my floor. I would get, not only did I get room and board, I also got a stipend. So I made money too. And to be very honest with you, the year that I did that, I saved my money and I saved my loan money. And that allowed me to transfer to Spelman. And when I graduated from Spelman, many of the girls that I graduated with owed six figures in debt because Spelman can be pretty expensive. Because I had transferred, I only owed $11,000. That's it. Now, the other lesson I'll tell you is whatever you owe, if you have to owe something, pay it off as soon as possible. Because I owe more because I kept deferring. When you're young and don't have a lot of responsibilities, your focus should be paying off whatever that debt is. And I wish somebody would have shared that with me at that time. Because if they had, I wouldn't have the debt I have today for student loans. Because I would have paid that little $11,000 is nothing. I would have paid that off. But at 21, $11,000 seemed like a lot. So I didn't focus on that. Don't make the mistake I did. Whatever you owe, let yourself really get focused in on trying to get rid of that debt. And the last thing I'll say Nowadays, there's a lot of programs that if you do incur debt, by the time you graduate, you could go be of service to your community for a year or two and get debt stricken from student loans. There's so many opportunities out there. You really should focus on taking care of that debt so that you could more quickly buy a home. You could um, go to grad school and not always much, but you really want to focus in on giving your best at school, constantly applying for scholarships year round while you're there so that you won't have so much owed when you graduate. But once you graduate, really focus in on decreasing whatever debt you may occur, uh, incur. So I hope my advice helped you. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Crystal. That was really, really great advice and um, right on point. And I can see a couple of parents that kind of chimed in and agreed with you. Um, so we're going to open up the floor now for questions. Um, if you do have questions, um, raise your hand and then we'll kind of bring you uh, forward so we can do it in an orderly fashion. And to get that kind of kicked off, I did have a question um, for both Ms. Galloway and for, for Crystal. <laughs> I wanted to know um, on behalf of all the parents that are on as well, how much of the work for uh, applying to scholarships and applying for the FAFSA and the TASFA and all these great acronyms, how much of that work um, can and should be done by parents and how much of that work can and should be the responsibility of the student? Um, I actually think it's best to do it with them because they do not know what they're doing. And then that causes more problems. So my son just graduated last year and I did it with him. And he's a, a freshman at the University of North Texas. And this time I did it for him. And he has to sign it because once you do it the first time, you're really kind of just, you know, tweaking it. So I want him to know what was done, but you don't want him to not do it. And then he, ha he doesn't have it. So I think it's best to do it with them so that they're just not dependent totally on you. But you want them to get as much as possible. And a lot of times they don't know what they're doing. Yes, I will agree with Ms. Crystal. <laughs> um, I know um, at DeBakey, I was working with, we had a financial aid uh, workshop and I was sitting with a parent, a student, and they called their parent because their parent wasn't present. 
and they were just like, hey, I need your social security number. I think any parent would be like, why do you need my social security number? So I tell students, they need to either one, bring their parent with them or under, understand parents can always come, but they need to tell their parent. I, and I tell them all the time, give me the phone. I will talk to your parent. But I tell them, you need to introduce this to them. Some say, hey, mom, I'm at school with Ms. Galloway. She's a college advisor. I'm here with you know my counselor, et cetera, et cetera. And we're working on the financial aid application. So I could potentially get some money for college. It is asking for your social security number. Do you feel comfortable giving that to me over the phone? And so I told him, do you see how we went from that to just, you know, so I tell, ideally it should be done together, especially on the FAFSA, it requires an electronic signature. And that's a signature by the student and signature by the parent. And so ideally it should be done together. Now my mom, she, <laughs> I'm first gen. So when she heard I wanted to go to college, she was just so excited, but she did my FAFSA for me every single year. And so now that I'm working with students, of course I know how to do it, but also I think just so parents are more in the know, it's kind of informed if you sit down with your parent and do it, uh, sorry, sit down with your student and do it with them. For one, it's just kind of a more, it's, it's an all-inclusive process. And just so you guys know, especially if you have multiple students <laughs> in the household, it just kind of helps you um, for the next year and the years to come. So definitely I think it should be done together with the, the student. I think once they start getting into maybe like their junior and senior year, they could probably start doing the FAFSA on their own because really it's just that first initial application when they're going to be a freshman where it takes not even a lot of time. The FAFSA can be done in less than 20 minutes. But the next year, a lot of that stuff kind of pre-fills in for them. And so the years after is not that hard to do. It's a pretty seamless process, but I think it should definitely be done together. Absolutely. Um, but I, I'm in the same situation as Crystal. I have one that I graduated last year and he, um, you know, so he's a freshman in, um, at U of H this year and um, he is very independent. So he's used to just kind of doing all of this stuff and he started to do it on his own and then got to the point where it was like, yeah, I don't know any of <laughs> this information. And if you're a household where one of the partners is the one that does the taxes and that's our situation, um, just kind of be on the same page, like from now on, from, you know, the time when your kid needs that, make sure that, you know, if, you're, if, if your financial situation is such that for whatever reason you defer the taxes or whatever, that, yeah, don't do that and have your taxes done, have them done early, electronically, you know, whatever, whatever. Um, if you have a complicated tax uh, situation because of a small business or whatever, um, that that's probably the most important thing I think you can do uh, for your kid is to make sure that all your texts are buttoned up and electronic and easy because it it does it sucks all the information up. Um, but um, it, we did kind of the opposite. Like we did it together um, last year when he was a senior, and then this year he just wanted like access, um, and he he was fine doing it on his own. But um, yeah. Good, good information, good information. So we do have a, a question in the chat um, and it is, do we need to fill these on uh, senior year or can we start from freshman year? Um, definitely senior year. Um, for the ninth, 10th and 11th graders, now some of them like to get a head start and they're like, they're like oh, well, I'll create my FSA ID, but nine times out of 10, by the time they reach the senior year, they don't even remember what that stuff looks like. They probably moved, their email address changed, their their phone number changed and all that stuff is really important for if you forgot your password, resetting it. And so I usually tell students and parents, I really would not worry about financial aid, doing anything for it, maybe like the summer when you're transitioning from junior year to senior year. So ideally, like for the most part, if you have a student who's an underclassman, you know, maybe just staying abreast to like what financial aid is, what it looks like. Like I said, it's changing next year. So just being in the know, but as far as starting the application, that doesn't need to be done until October of their senior year. Okay. And then we have another question. Um, how much um, merit scholarships are available and um, are they few or many? So the merit of uh, financial aid or the merit-based uh, financial aid, that's based off of like their, you know, their academic profile, GPA, um, SAT scores, ACT, stuff like that. And so oftentimes what happens is majority of your schools, what they're doing is once the student's application is received, they're looking at that stuff and they're like, you know what? We'll offer this student a merit-based scholarship. Like UTSA has something called Top Scholar. It's not something that the student 
it's not a separate application that the student has to apply to. It's just a matter of the student sending their college application to the school and the school just looking at it and they're like, you know what, we'll give the student a scholarship. So it's kind of, I don't wanna say they're few, they can be, but they kind of make those decisions within their admissions team. And so oftentimes it's just a matter of applying and just kind of seeing what you get. This is why I tell students you wanna apply by a priority deadline because sometimes that's where those merit-based scholarships are offered as well. Okay, and then my, our, can I just, uh, yeah, of course, my experience with that is that not as many as I thought or not as many as was like my, uh, my husband was a National Merit Scholar. Um, so that was like early 90s, uh, early to mid 90s. And um, it was like a full ride, like full, that, that's how he was able to literally like make a profit um, working as an RA as an undergrad, because, um, you know, that little bit of stipend that we got, um, he just got to keep it. Um, our, our son was also national merit and it doesn't pay for housing. So I'm like, how's that a full ride? <laughs> he has yeah. to live somewhere, does he not? Um, so, um, so, and, and that was kind of like the best offer was, um, you know, uh, so uh, we didn't find that the, the merit um, offers were like, I think as, as plentiful, plentiful or as generous as we expected. That was just our experience. That's good to know. One yeah, that's, that's very good to know. Um, and then we have another question. Uh, do top tier institutions like Ivy Leagues also offer merit-based scholarships? Yeah, that's a doozy. Um, again, and a lot of these questions are going to be like, it, it depends because each school has a different formula or different way for determining how to give students financial aid. Um, some of your Ivies, um, they're looking at, some of them are going to be um, need blind. So they're not necessarily looking at um, your financial aid and stuff like that to determine admissions. That's gonna come a lot later. But for the um, schools like Rice and stuff like that, um, they're may, they're looking at, I usually tell students, they're, they're looking at like high, high SAT scores. They're definitely looking at GPA. And then also, they're also looking at, most of them are looking at how well you write. So I usually tell students when they're doing these scholarship applications, which most of them are going to be in-house. So right now, for example, UT Austin, the students have to go into their My Status portal. They think, oh, I've already submitted all my documents, I'm done. Absolutely not. Most schools have like an in-house scholarship application. And they need to do that to qualify for institutional aid, so additional scholarships within the university. And so it's kind of a doozy because a lot of times these Ivy Leagues, they have their own in-house process and they're not telling anyone. So of course, if they're telling us, I'm gonna be telling y'all, hey, your students do this, that, and that. They're not, it's all in-house and nobody knows. Like, it's like, there's no secret sauce or there's no formula. They just kind of have their own in-house thing. And they're just kind of, I don't wanna say they're keeping it to themselves, but they have their own process for how they do that and they're not really telling many people at all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, the next question we have is, FAFSA does not apply for parents who are on work visas. Um, and that's a question. So non-US residents. Yeah, and yes. then the, I think the last question is connected to that. Are the tuition going to be different for those? Oh, yes, okay. So for, yes, yeah, so for parents who are on work visas um, and they are considered non-US um, residents, now if your student was born here in the US, then yes, they can do the FAFSA. And so you can still provide your information, but when it starts asking for like um, social security number and stuff like that, unless you have a green card, you'd put that in. But if not, you just put in all zeros. So if your child was born here, they can still do the FAFSA. You can still provide your information. Um, you just would not be able to sign electronically. Instead, what it's gonna ask for is it's going to uh, prompt your student to print out a um, signature page. They would have to take it back to you. You'd have to manually sign it and then it will be mailed off to the address that's on there. And I usually help students with mailing that off. But if, yes, if your student was born here, they can absolutely do FAFSA, but when it's requiring your information, um, you'd have to put all zeros in for the social and like physically sign a page. And then uh, for the tuition fees, um, it doesn't necessarily change because most um, colleges and universities, if you're gonna be considered an international student. And so international students typically would pay like out of state um, tuition. Now, I usually tell students, 
again, for international students, Texas is one of the states that offers not only in-state tuition, but also in-state financial aid for those students. And so while you are just confi confined to Texas schools, it does work out to their benefit. And then also there's a ton, tons of scholarships that don't necessarily have that designation where you have to be a US citizen to apply. So it is a de definitely a lot harder for international students to get aid, but it's definitely possible for sure. I hope that answered your question. And then, oh, one, one last tidbit. Um, if your student has definitely, if they're on a visa, but they've been living here for at least a year up until they graduate, or if they've been living in Texas for at least three years, they're considered a Texas resident, and maybe not a US citizen, but they're considered a Texas resident, and then they could do the task book. Excellent, excellent. Thank you so much. So that kind of brings us to the end of our call today. Um, thank you everyone for participating and um, Ms. Galloway as well as uh, Crystal, thank you for um, leading the conversation today. I'm hoping that a lot of parents got some uh, great money saving tips. Um, our next call in this series will skip a week and it will be on November the 30th. So, um, two Wednesdays from today. And um, at the same time, we will be sending out a new Zoom link. So look for that. Thank you everyone for participating. Thank you all so much. Thank you so much. Good night. Bye-bye. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Thank you all. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, Crystal. You're welcome. So, Aliyah, last time I logged off and mm -hmm. I think it kicked the call out. So I'm going to wait for a couple of minutes so we can. Um, oh, thank you, Dr. Lagwan Krishnan. Mm. says that he is happy to volunteer. All right, I'm going to actually, oh, yay. let me stop the recording. Um, okay, and then you'll have to tell me where I can find the 